Alexei Navalny has never been afraid to stand up to Vladimir Putin, but the Russian opposition leader's activism has come at a huge personal cost. Over the last decade, he has been attacked and detained. In 2020, he was poisoned with the same nerve agent used in the Salisbury poisonings. Miraculously, he survived, but only thanks to the treatment he received in a German hospital. On return to Russia, he was jailed on charges he says were politically motivated. The European Court of Human Rights has agreed, demanding his release. But today, he remains incarcerated. Now, a documentary about Alexei Navalny's attempt to find out who poisoned him is nominated for an Oscar and a BAFTA. I've been speaking to its director, Daniel Raw, about the impact of the film and what we know now about Alexei Navalny's current condition. Daniel, thank you for coming on the show. Now, your documentary about Navalny is gripping, it's moving, it's quite an extraordinary piece of work and an extraordinary story. But first, can you explain to our viewers where Alexei Navalny is being held, what sort of facility he's in and, and what shape he's in? Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me on the program. It's great to be with you here today. And any opportunity to talk about Navalny is mm. very meaningful for me because the sad reality is that he's not doing well. Mm. Unfortunately, our film does not have a happy ending. Right now, Navalny is languishing in a penal colony about six and a half hours outside of Moscow. Um, he has been, for most of the last six months, removed from the general prison population and is instead languishing in solitary mm. confinement. And he is being held in what um, many international observers will, will say is torturous conditions. You know, they, it's as if these, these prison authorities wake up every morning and, and ask themselves how they can make this guy's life miserable. Mm. And it's important that your viewers know the reason he's specifically in solitary confinement, and this is very important, is because of his anti-war advocacy. Alexei mm. Navalny is the number one mm. anti-war advocate in Russia today, and that's why he's in solitary confinement languishing. And do you think that the start of the Ukraine war intensified the brutality against Navalny by the Russian authorities because of this, right? I think the start of the Ukraine war intensified the pressure on not just Navalny, but all oppositionists, mm. all uh, uh, political people with different opinions, all independent news outlets. Navalny is one man, but he seems to represent hundreds if not thousands of, of uh, independent Russians who have had to sacrifice a great deal in opposition of this war. And Daniel, Navalny's supporters believe his life is in grave danger right now. How worried are you about whether he can survive? I'm extraordinarily worried. It's, it's very scary. You know, he is in the custody of the same men who tried to murder him once. What's stopping them from trying again? It's, it's urgent, it's vital, the world needs to pay attention to Navalny, we cannot forget him. That's how I frame the primary responsibility of our documentary, mm. is to provide the world with, with a, a vehicle to get to know him and to learn about his and story. There's also the bravery of his family who feature very heavily his two children and his wife, Yulia, in the documentary, and they clearly are very tight uh, loving family, um, how are they bearing up? Do you, you presume they're in contact with the family? Yeah. They must be missing their dad terribly. I, I think that the, the dignity of Yulia Navalny is such that she keeps her cards pretty close mm -hmm. to her chest. I think it's a Russian thing. But you can only imagine what it must be like if your husband, if your father is in this horrible position, this horrible place, you know he's not doing well. You know that he's being tortured. That must be a burden that I can't even imagine that certainly no college age or, or, or high school age student should have to endure. Um, but the family, like their father, has this remarkable courage. When you release the film, and Navalny was imprisoned again. Did you fear the consequences it released might have for him? Or did you hope that this amplification of his story might actually give him better protection? Or were you just not sure? Well, the film premiered three weeks before this awful, 
horrendous war in Ukraine started. Mm -hmm. And I think when the, when the war began, everyone was existing in this ocean of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? What would stop these lunatics from murdering Navalny as they are raining bombs mm -hmm. down on this country in Central Europe, on Ukraine? Mm -hmm. And so we thought that we had to do, we had a responsibility to do whatever we could to try and keep Navalny's name in the global consciousness mm -hmm. as a mechanism to dissuade the regime from murdering him. And so we had this very fancy film release plan. You know, films are released at a very specific time. There's lots of planning that goes into their rollout and their promotion. We threw it all away. And instead we embarked on a uh, expedited, get this film out into the world as quickly as possible mission. And the potential consequences of which we were not concerned about. What mattered most to us was the security and safety of Navalny. And if this film can move the dial five or 10% in dissuading the regime from murdering him, we understood we had a responsibility to get it out. I guess the question obviously follows from that, Daniel, is if, if they tried to murder him once and now they have him incarcerated, why won't they try to murder him again? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very fair question, and that's why I think Navalny is in a very, very scary position. My working calculus, um, I call it the, the pain in the ass index. We, there's sort of like, is it more of a pain in the ass for, for the regime to murder him mm. or to instead let him languish? Yeah. And what that speaks to is what would the domestic response be? How many hundreds of thousands of people would take to the streets? Would that potentially be the straw that breaks the camel's back and gets people engaged, yeah. gets people out into the streets? And I think the regime doesn't want to figure that out. So instead they say, we'll let him live, but we will break his spirit, we will break his body, we will break his well-being, and we will let him languish in this cell. I would prefer, of course, that he is freed and that he is reunited with his family. But more than anything, we just need him to survive this. Because mm. it's my opinion that his impact on the future of Russia is unfulfilled. Mm. And I would like to see the day when he is able to run in a free and fair democratic election in the Russian Federation. And Daniel, arguably the most gripping part of the film is when Navalny with the help of Christo, is able to identify suspects behind his poisoning. Yeah. Uh, and they find telephone numbers. I mean, it's an incr <laughs> It's hardly believable. Right. Right? It's so extraordinary. <laughs> but, you know, they essentially prank them, these guys, by pretending to be aides to FSB agents and get information about his poisoning. And you can't actually quite believe that someone is just over the telephone handing over this information. Can you explain what happened on that day and what you were thinking when you are capturing that moment? Sure. Navalny started the day um, just trying, just as himself. He'd get a guy on the phone, he'd say, this is Navalny, why'd you try and murder me? And then they'd hang up, yeah, and yeah. it was not a successful attempt. And then at a certain point, someone decided, I think Maria suggested, let's try it the prank way. The backup option, where Navalny yeah. would try and impersonate a high-ranking FSB guy <laughs> and see if he could fool someone, which sounded as... Outlandish, outlandish to me then as it does now. Um, but they made the first call, then they made the second call, and the third call they called up this chemist called Konstantin Kudratsev. And I don't speak a word of Russian, so I'm just trying to intuitively figure out where to put the camera. Yeah. But once they got this guy on the phone, I sort of clocked out of the corner of my eye as Maria Pepchik, yeah. Navalny's chief investigator, I saw her jaw unhinge and hit the floor. Yeah. And I understood that something yeah. extraordinary was happening. And you didn't have to speak a word of Russian to know exactly what was going down. Constantine the chemist yeah. 
you you say you say in the film that afterwards you all say they're going to kill him, they're going to kill yeah. him when they when we put this out. What happened to him? You don't know. Well, it's, it's unclear. We thought for a while that he was dead. We thought that he had been disappeared. Yeah. It came into focus about a year ago. I think Christo dug up uh, a COVID database, uh, a database of COVID tests, and his name was on it somewhere in Siberia. So we think he's alive, but perhaps he has been relegated to some terrible desk job in the remote re regions of Russia for this horrible indiscretion mm. he, he perpetrated. Right at the end of the film, you ask him, what is the message to the Russian people if they imprison you or kill you? And he answers the question about, if they kill me, this is the message. And you ask him to do it in Russian. Yeah. And it's the way into the film. And, and he says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing, so don't do nothing. The question I had as a viewer afterwards was, what was his answer about if he was imprisoned? Because that became his reality. They didn't kill him, but they imprisoned him. What did he answer on that question? Well, I don't remember verbatim. I'd have to look at the transcripts. Um, but I would imagine that it was in a very similar vein. Do not give up. Do not look down. He said something very poignant. We cannot look down. We have to look up and we have to, we have to tackle this thing head on. These bad guys are only able to exist if good people do nothing, so don't be inactive. And that is not just a call to Russian citizens. That's a call to citizens all over the world. Over the last 10, 15, 20 years, we have seen um, the rise of authoritarianism take different insidious forms and proliferate to different pockets and corners of the world that we thought were immune to this type of, this type of instinct. And what Navalny's saying doesn't just apply to Russia, it applies to, to, to citizens all over the world. As his friend and as someone that has worked with him and knows him well, on a personal level, do you wish he hadn't gone back, given what's happened? Because that's how I ended the film. I thought, don't go back. You know, it's challenging to say. First off, I always wonder if his calculus would have been different if he had a crystal ball and knew that this war, this horrendous war, was going to begin. Would he have still gone back in that context? But the reality is we had no idea. He, he had the information he had, and he made the decision he made. It was a political decision. I think if you were here right now, what he might suggest is that staying out of the country, staying in exile, would be too great a gift to the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. So he had to go back. He wants to be the moral leader of the nation, and, and unfortunately for him, that meant and I sacrificing himself in this way. Well, Dan, you thanks for coming in, and certainly the film has amplified his story and, and, and you have managed to get it nominated in the, the biggest theatre yeah. in the world, which can only be good, good for him as well. So thank you so much for coming in and talking to us about well, the documentary. Thank you so much for having me. My, I'm, I'm sad that Alexei Navalny won't get to go to the BAFTAs or the Oscars, but he's with us in spirit and any chance to talk about the film is meaningful. So thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's conversations. I found both of them absolutely fascinating. Now, if you scan this QR code on your screen now, you can watch all of our interviews online and all the previous episodes of the show. And if you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can listen to Beth Rigby Interviews, our podcast. That's on the Sky News app or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, that's all for today's show. Thank you so much to my guests, Daniel Raw and Dex Hunter-Torek. And thank you for watching. Hope to see you next week.